Thank you very much. I'm so honored to be here. Thank you, Ted. Let me grab the clicker. So honored to be here with 19 of my fellow healthcare disciplines. Uh, it's really a treat. I don't think I've ever been with all of you at the same time. So it's really lovely. Can, can everybody hear OK? So I'm really uh, thrilled to be here and talk about um, our initiative at the University of Virginia. You know, I came as a dean. It's 10 years. Uh, this summer, and I came with a platform of create a healthy work and learning environment where everyone flourishes. So it was easy for me to answer Ted's question. And I live on the lawn at the University of Virginia. I'm one of the deans, so I have no excuse to not. Um, the students are right there uh, living next to me, so it is wonderful. Um, so what I'm going to talk about, though, is something that we've initiated um, in the last nine years. And I love this quote from Pico Iyer, and I am a critical care and trauma nurse, 15 years at shock trauma in Baltimore and then other big places all over the country, wonderful places. I've been very lucky. But one of the things that I learned when I went to Upaya, which is a Zen Buddhist retreat up in uh, Santa Fe with Roshi Joan Halifax, um, was this whole concept of you know, slowing down to notice so that you can make a difference in the world. And as a dean, I take it very seriously. What, what can I do that no one else can do? Um, hire great people that have the philosophies we're talking about that are going to be open to change, et cetera. So I know what an emergency is. That's why I put this slide. That is probably like shock trauma. But if we act like everything is an emergency all the time, then we're missing so much across all of our disciplines. And I know that there's a lot of suffering in our patients, families, communities, and caregivers, but I wanted our gentleman over here who asked that wonderful question about, um, well, can't we change our language? We also are part of the Joy in Work initiative, and if we have time, I'd love to tell you about that. That was fabulous. So there's a lot of suffering, and we're implementing design thinking, too. Um, we also train people together. I'm in an academic health center. I tell the School of Medicine all the time, the reason we're an academic health center is because we have a school of nursing, and they understand that. I wish we had more. We don't have 19 disciplines, although I know we have anthropology, for sure, and I heard somebody <laughs> mention that. So we train our students together. That's Tina Brashears, who many people know. She's now retired, but she did so much wonderful work pulling pulling us together. But one of the best things we did was we hired an architect. Um, we do something called cluster hires. And this gentleman, Elgin Cleckley, does design thinking for compassion. So he is perfection. He's shared with architecture, nursing, and education. And he has done some amazing work teaching courses. And our students are taking them, which is great. And in fact, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna talk about a better example than incentive spirometry, but we are using design thinking in our clinical practicums, and people are changing um, the way they're looking at some things that are routine practices. Um, but the one that I really wanted to talk about, which has gotten a lot of press, is the story of the pause and Jonathan Bartels. And he and I went to Upaya together. We had a generous funder in 09 who said, you know, I want to send people to this program. So the first group of us went, docs, nurses, um, social workers, chaplains. Um, the individual paid for the first of us to go. And I said, I'm, you know, I'm a brand new dean. I can't go. And she kept hitting me on the knee saying, you need to go. You need to go. What was the best thing I ever did? First of all, I got to know a lot of people. And it's a mindfulness-based program called Being With Dying, which had all about meditation. And you know, being with dying is about what? The living, right? How to take good care. And so we learned many things. Jonathan and I, I didn't even know him, but he was kind of a rough ER nurse. Look at that, all those tattoos. But he's really a gentle giant, <laughs> gentle giant. And he came, we came back completely bonded. And we put into place the beginnings of this initiative um, and to look at how we could relieve suffering, how we can alleviate human suffering. So what he did for a project was to look at, um, in the ER, when someone comes in and codes, arrests, like a seven-year-old hit by a car, not uncommon in busy ERs, the team works so hard to save someone that they don't even know who it was. 
somebody's daughter, somebody's sister or brother. And at the end, they rip their gloves off. The room is packed. They rip their gloves off and go out in the hallway. And what's in the hallway? More patience. No time to kind of shake it off. So he developed 45 seconds, and everybody stands around the bedside to honor that patient who nobody knows or knew, and to honor the good work of the team. And it has caught on. You know, this was about, what, maybe seven years ago now. And he, um, I knew it caught on in our hospital when the anesthesiologist up on one of the floors with a bad code after a young, a young guy died, he said, can we just stop and do the pause like they do in the ER? Now, this from an anesthesiologist. I said, all right, if the docs are picking up what nurses started, this is a good thing. Now it is in... 100 hospitals, it's in four continents, and Cleveland Clinic just picked it up. So this is started by a bachelor's prepared nurse who's part of our initiative, and this is where we did a lot of starting. So I said that we need to create compassionate nurses and leaders for the 21st century because people are coming into nursing and leaving, and a year later they have a broken heart because they can't do what we train them to do. Not that we're in an ivory tower, but the practice environment, as everyone has mentioned, is not conducive. And uh, we decided to let's look at ourselves, what we can do to change. So this is our big goal, um, reducing human suffering, cultivating compassionate people and systems. And we are about actions. You can't say you're compassionate, can't have all those signs and all these hospitals, we respect, we, and then you look at the actions actually doesn't match. So we're looking at our impact. Right now we have um, a retreat program. We have courses. I've taken two really dumpy classrooms and turned them into mindfulness rooms, meditation rooms, 40 yoga mats, movable furniture. Um, and I did that in the last couple of years. Uh, so we have um, five days a week, free. Mindfulness, meditation, yoga, tai chi, free massage for the entire university. Um, what happens is it's mostly nursing and medicine on our side, but the word has gotten out um, and people are coming over. And we also teach four courses on resilience, flourishing, how to have a meaningful life. Isn't it amazing how 18-year-olds want to take that course? Um, you would be surprised. So we have waiting lists. And we have some preliminary data that our impact um, on the nurses that graduate from our school are different than the nurses um, that come from other schools. Now, long term, does it impact patient and family and engagement? But that's where we are. We're also in the hospital because the turnover is terrible. We're in another huge shortage. Um, and burnout is a big issue. So we're doing retreats for nurse managers assistant nurse managers, resilient retreats, and the pause. It says here 60 hospitals, but it's really closer to 100. And it's in the UK, Ireland, Australia, South Africa, um, around the world. So just a couple of other things, because I have a very brief time, but we have something called ambassadors. We have faculty, student, and um, clinician ambassadors on 26 inpatient units. The faculty actually were not totally on board with me, in 2009. Somebody thought I was pushing religion, believe it or not. Um, I said, well, contemplative practices are part of the world's religions. Um, but I still had some mothers say, well, yoga is against our religion. I was like, well, all right, we'll just wait and see. But now the students love it, and the students want it, and the medical students are coming over. Um, so anyway, the ambassadors, there's a cart. Um, it has little sayings and chocolate and dogs, therapy dogs, and people come out of the rooms like you wouldn't believe, residents, nurses. Um, I was there for change of shift of the dogs. Um, it was a Bernese Mountain Dog, and then it became a Golden Retriever. And dogs can only work two hours. I said, there is a message here, because everybody, <laughs> everybody is 12, you know, running. Nurses don't have time to go to the bathroom. People are short and critical with each other when they're stressed, right? So I think we got to, and the veterinarian, I'm here with the veterinarians, which is great. <laughs> so our model is self-care, resilience, compassion. Let's focus on self-care. It's not selfish. 
Nurses think it's selfish. It's not. Our students are getting this now. That will build resilient individuals, and then resilient individuals will go on. Hopefully, we'll create an army to really have compassionate patient care. I love this picture. We teach our students to be fully present, to take that deep breath like our colleague right here, like you taught us. Take that deep breath, ground through your feet, and then go in the room to do the three-hour dressing change, right? So this is our resiliency initiative. I think we're getting known for it now. We have a beautiful farm, Morven, donated to the university. We live in the Blue Ridge Mountains. And this is clinical time. We have way over what you need. This is clinical time. It's not a picnic. Um, they go out for retreats. Um, and it's pretty special. Reflective writing, resting. You know that room I built, the mindful classroom, with 40 yoga mats, cushions, blankets. When it's not in use, students can go in there and whatever. And I had a faculty come to me recently who said, well, I want you to know I caught some students sleeping in that room. And I said, isn't that fabulous? <laughs> and so she went, what a way. But most, mostly people are coming on board. You know, s college students are chronically sleep deprived. And I bet you the workforce, right? Three days, I bet you the workforce is too. So I was also asked, to, well, what does it cost to do this? Well, in 09, I got an endowed professor. Um, I didn't fill it for several years, but I spent every nickel of it. I was allowed to do that. It spins off so much, so built that up, sent people to um, the Upaya retreats. I now have raised money. I've sent 70 teams to Upaya. Docs, nurses, social workers, chaplains. I have a nutritionist. Um, people are kind of lining up to go. And uh, when they come back, they're different people. And they also have this incredible network. So I asked the dean of medicine one time, well, you know, would you you know, give me some money, you know, 5000 and we'll, we'll share. And he said, no, it's really not our priority. I said, okay, just so you know, when they come back, they're going to be loyal to us. <laughs> Actually, that's work. So <laughs> it's worked to our advantage to be generous and send people, you know. So we've got research program. A foundation just gave us half a million dollars, and the hospital is now realizing they spent $90 million in the last few years um, recruiting nurses. That the cost that um, you know, Mary Jo mentioned is true. What, what if they spent a little fraction of that on these kinds of things, right? It would be a different workforce. So here are expenses. We've, like I said, I raised the money. My generous alumni and donors um, care about this because selfishly, who's going to take care of them, right? They are worried. So we spent money on workshops for faculty. Um, as you see here, and it costs about 110000 to offer these free practices. You know, Charlottesville is one of those communities where a lot of yoga teachers and tai chi and people that want to do this. Um, and so I have a ready, ready group that comes. And we offer it in the library, the hospital. Um, we've built resilience rooms. And so I will stop there. But... Um, it's a wonderful initiative. It is on the individual level, but I do believe individuals are going to change. Um, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much.